Jonah, the Reluctant Prophet, a presentation written and narrated by Chuck Missler. We're in the book of Jonah. Jonah is one of the two prophets that came from Galilee, despite what John 7, verse 52 says. Does any prophet come out of Galilee? The guy that said that and didn't do his homework, because both Nahum and Jonah came out of Galilee, and both Nahum and Jonah preached to Nineveh. About a century apart, Jonah being ultimately more successful than Nahum in the sense that he brought them to repentance and so forth. Jonah is the great missionary book of the Old Testament, very important book in, the, in Judaism. It's read on Yom Kippur. So if you have some feeling for the seven feasts of Moses, that's certainly a high day that elevates Jonah as a very important book. Name means dove. His father's name means truthful. There are at least ten miracles in the book of Jonah. And the world is fixated on the tr most trivial of the bunch. This whole business of the fish. Not a whale, a ketos is a fish. But the storm, the selection of Jonah as guilty, the sudden subsiding as well as the coming of the storm, and of course the great fish at the right time at the right place, and the preservation of Noah, that's about as far as we got last time, and his ejection, chapter 2 ends with his ejection on dry land. We're going to see before the evening's over several others, the gourd, the worm, the east wind, in chapter 4, strange chapter 4. But the most important miracle of all is one that no one talks about. And that's the repentance of this entire city, city of Nineveh. It's the only case of a prophet being sent to the heathen in the Old Testament. Just an interesting little observation. If Jonah was the prophet sent to the heathen, what port did he leave from? Joppa. We would know it today as Joppa, but in those days in the Bible it's Joppa. Which of the apostles was sent to the Gentiles? Yes, and which of the original? Peter. That's what I was going for, Acts 10, right? Remember Peter, the sheep? Both Peter and Jonah were loath to go to the Gentiles, right? Peter was called. Remember the sheep? Taken and eaten. Everything wasn't kosher. Fine, but don't call what I has sanctified as unclean. Right? Remember that? Where did that take place? Joppa. Isn't that interesting? That's what we call a coincidence. Yes. <laughs> as you know, coincidence is not a kosher word. Okay. You all know the story, not to review all of last time, but to get the pace of it. You all know that Jonah was called, arise, go to Nineveh. And Jonah, being very, very responsive, immediately went the other way. <laughs> he was, and they say in the Navy, turn 1-8, right? 180 degree turn. Right? And he took the first ship he could get out of Joppa to Tarshish, which is to the west, Nineveh is to the east. And uh, we had these very experienced Phoenician sailors get shook because they recognize this peculiar storm there rose was something unnatural. And the whole episode of the, the, the sailors, how they dumped their baggage, and then even after they knew who was guilty, rode hard, but to, to no avail. Same thing you and I do. You get rid of all the baggage you like, you can work as hard as you can. You can't get salvation that way. How did they get salvation? By offering one. Jonah didn't jump overboard. He asked them to take him and throw him overboard. He was offered. So you see a typology there? Yeah, okay. And as you all know, I don't think Jonah had any idea there was going to be a fish come along. Or at least not that kind of a fish. Huh? What's this? This is Jaws Zero or something? <laughs> yeah, it gets worse. It gets, gets worse. And of course, the main emphasis, you see all these articles and you even find Christian commentaries and books written by well-intended Christian expositor describing some event in history that's very similar where some guy was swallowed by a whale and after 18 hours was recoverable. Uh, they cut him open and put him in an operating room, intensive care in six weeks. He said, well, hey, that wasn't Jonah. He was there not 18 hours, three days, three nights. That's important. And also, uh, he spewed, got speed around dry land, and he, I assume, dusted himself off and went to Nineveh. No intensive care, no recuperating. He was on his way. So the main point is it's a miracle. God intended it that way. It's unique. God prepared the fish. The United States government can take 70 guys and put them in a Polaris submarine and go under the ice cap and make history some years ago. I think uh, over, what was that, 90 days under water? No, six months, I think it was, underwater. If the United States government can do it. I think God can do one guy for three days. For 600 years, the book of Jonah was a Old Testament fish story. Interesting story. Until Jesus Christ came along and made an allusion to it that we must not lose sight of. Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 and 40. Let's just refresh our memory, look at that again, because it's going to be very important to us. 
it puts the story of Jonah and the big fish in a totally different light. And we'll start Matthew 12, 38. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. No kidding. I mean, he's raised the dead. He's healed lepers. He's healed blind. I mean, you, you list it. You know, it's, he's done it. By the time you get to Matthew 12, there's quite an inventory of miracles. But these guys would see a sign. <laughs> But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. A couple important things there, don't miss. Prophet Jonah. Jonah is not a story, a legend, a myth, a literary oddity. He was a prophet. Jesus Christ himself authenticates the book of Jonah. Also, Jonah was a sign. He was a sign to the Ninevites. What was the god of Nineveh? Dagon, a fish god. How interesting, huh? Oh, not fun. Yeah. That was the breath of discovery. Wasn't that fun to hear that? Ooh. But he's even a more important sign. He was assigned to the Ninevites. If you take the incarnation of Dagon that they the particular style they worshipped was onus, and if you put an I in front of it, you have the spelling of Jonah in the Greek for the New Testament. Nebuchadnezzar was the Aramaic for the prophet Jonah, and it's the name of an Assyrian mound. And an archaeologist, realizing what the name meant, excavated, and that's how Nineveh was discovered. The old city was discovered. It was because of its identity with the prophet Jonah. But he's a, Jonah is another kind of a sign, vastly more significant to you and I. And that's the sign here in Authenticated, Matthew 12. No sign but they were given it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay. Where is Sheol? Center of the earth. We talked about the bottomless pit last time, the Abuso. We talked about Gehenna, Hades, and Sheol, the difference in those words. Hades and Sheol being the abode of the dead, geocentric concept. Gehenna, the lake of fire, the eternal, the place prepared for the devil and his angels. Yet future, out in the outer darkness. Hades will be thrown ultimately in Gehenna. Different concepts, important study, Luke 16, primary reference, and of course, from there all through the Bible. Some 50 times mentioned, and most of those by the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is a hell, and we have it on good authority. Now, what state was Jesus during those three days and three nights? He was dead and buried, right? Right? He rose again the third day, right? From that point of view, plus subtleties of the text that we talked about and some others will touch on, many scholars, and I'm one of them that leans to the view that Jonah died. That he was as three days and three nights in the belly of... He, he prays from Sheol, the boat of the dead. You'll see in his language. So it's subtle, technical, not insisting on it. You don't have to embrace that idea. But it's an important insight. It's an important insight because he was intended as a type of none other than your Savior and mine. And that type, I believe, is in that sense complete. In any case, as... Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. It's not hard to take the case of Nineveh, this gigantic, dominant capital city of the Gentile world, and draw an analogy to the United States. The men of Nineveh will rise in judgment against this generation, too, I believe. Billy Graham said it so eloquently. If God doesn't judge America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. So Jonah is far more important to you and I than just another piece of our Old Testament background. The Lord Jesus Christ points this rather vigorously. And so in chapter 1, of course is the preamble. Chapter 2 is the, uh, we went through this last time, where Jonah is in the fish and uh, and prays uh, out of the abdomen of the fish and out of the hollow place of Sheol, is the proper technical translation. The key phrase in chapter 2, salvation is of the Lord. 
all the baggage that the sailors threw over, all the hard rowing they did, you name it, nothing availed. Salvation is of the Lord. I'm sure Jonah didn't realize. You know, when we see Abraham doing a type of Christ in Genesis 22, we can tell from the text Abraham had a sense that he was acting on prophecy. There's no evidence, as you'll see in chapter 4, there's no evidence that Jonah had any insight that he was also a type uh, or a prophetic uh, pointer, if you will, to uh, our Savior. But he does, his key word is, he says, uh, salvation is of the Lord in verse 9, chapter 2. And the Lord spoke unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon dry land. Okay. Now, before we get into chapter 3, I would like to deal with a couple of things, since the link to Jonah for you and I is from Matthew 12. I mean, yes, we have an interest in Jonah because it's part of our Old Testament background, but our link here is of the type. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about three days and three nights because that's the, literally the way the Lord said it. Let's do a little poking around. Let's turn to Matthew 27, 63. The context is Jesus has died, Matthew 27, verse 63, and buried in Joseph of Arimathea's sepulcher. Verse 62, the next day that following the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Here are his adversaries recalling this statement. It's amazing how many things he said they didn't understand, but whatever else is true, they did catch on to the idea that he was to be raised from the dead on the third day. You might turn to Mark 8.31. Caesarea Philippi, Philip's famous confession. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he charged me to tell no man. And then he began to teach them, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things. In other words, after that declaration by Peter is when he starts letting them in on what the mission's all about. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and by the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. We have all kinds of evidence they didn't grab it. They remembered it later that he taught them so. But, of course, Peter here, this is also where he uh, says, Not so, Lord. <laughs> That's an oxymoron. Huh? Not so, Lord. Huh? But anyway, um, we also looked last time, but just to refresh your memory, on the definition of the gospel itself in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 4, when, when Paul gives us the kernel of the gospel, the key parts of it. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that, uh, that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And when it says Scriptures here, it means the Old Testament. What place is in the Old Testament? You can extract this from the story of Noah, strangely enough. You certainly can extract it from Jonah, as we've seen, and also from Genesis 22, plus other places. So the Old Testament has clear teaching that it's the third day. And, of course... The key verse for us is the, in Jonah 1.17, the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Okay, what I'm getting at is this tradition that Jesus was crucified on Friday afternoon. And we celebrate Easter when? Sunday morning. When did Jesus rise from the dead? Saturday night. How is the Jewish time reckoned? You go to the Torah. Let's turn to Genesis 1. And early in the Torah, we have instituted a concept that is very Jewish. Genesis chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, God saw light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. The point is, the concept of the evening to the morning. See, we think of midnight to midnight. That's our Roman, if you will, uh, heritage. The Jewish day started at sundown, or in a civil sense, at 6, 6 p.m., right? 6 to 6. And so at sundown each day. There's a whole lunar and uh, sidereal linkage here, but the main idea is that it's evening and morning is a day. You see that down here in verse 8? God called the firm in heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day, right? Verse 13, verse 19, same thing. Pattern set. The other idea that we stumble over is this concept of the Sabbath. You and I are all acquainted with what would be called Shabbat. Six days you work, the seventh is Shabbat. In their calendar, it's Saturday. We tend to think of our week as starting Monday, but let's not get into all that. So when does Shabbat start? 
F Friday evening, when the sun goes down, starts Shabbat, you bet. Now, in the Gospels, the whole idea is the body had to come down because the next day was a Sabbath, huh? Except the problem is, is most of us don't understand what a Sabbath is. A Sabbath is not just Shabbat, or the seventh day. Let's turn to Leviticus 23. And we won't go through a whole study of Leviticus 23. There are tapes on that if you're interested. In Leviticus 23, you'll discover there are seven feasts. The... First one is the Passover Sabbath. In the 14th day of the first month of evening is the Lord's Passover. In the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the Lord. Seven days you'll see unleavened bread and so forth. It's Holy Convocation. Um, Passover is on the 14th of Nisan, right? The next day is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's the 15th of Nisan. The third feast is the Feast of First Fruits. And many, many of your guides will tell you it's on the 17th of Nizon. That's not quite correct. I would make it the 17th, three days after the 14th, it fits, but unfortunately it isn't that simple. Feast of First Fruits was the morning after the Sabbath after Passover. So depending on what day of the week Passover fell, it would be whatever number of days Sunday morning is after Passover. The Passover would move depending on where 14th of Nizon is. Do you follow me? turns out that on the Lord's resurrection, it was a Sunday morning, which was three days and three nights after the 14th of Nisan. The Feast of Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover Sabbath. Without getting into all of these, let's take a look at verse 24 and 25. And this has to do with the Feast of Trumpets. I'm going to suggest that each one of these feasts is a high day. Each one of these feasts is a Sabbath. And you'll see it mentioned here. Speaking to the children of Israel, saying, The seventh month and the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy congregations. Yeah, it's not necessarily a, a Shabbat, but it's a Sabbath. It's not a Saturday. It's a high day. You shall do no servile work therein, but make an offering at fire of the Lord. I'll come down to verse um, 32, where it's talking about Yom Kippur. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month and evening, and so forth. So Yom Kippur, is that a Sabbath? Yes. Is it on the Saturday? Not necessarily. And the Feast of Tabernacles. You pop down to verse 39. And the fifteenth day of the seventh month you shall have gathered in the fruit of the land. You shall keep a feast on the Lord seven days. The first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. Really? You mean there's Sabbaths that's eight days apart, not seven? Yes, when it has to do with Feast of Tabernacles. Why? Because that's the new beginning. First three feasts of Moses are in the first month, month of Nisan. They all point historically to events. They also point prophetically to Jesus Christ's first coming in various ways. When was he offered? On Passover. When did he rise? At the Feast of First Fruits. Who is the first fruits of the resurrection? Jesus Christ. So the Feast of Moses are prophetic. The last three of the seven are in the seventh month. They all point to his second coming in various ways. So it's no surprise that the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the climactic one, has the number eight associated with it, the number of new beginnings. Between these two groups of three, there's one called Pentecost. It's the only one where they were instructed to use leavened bread, not unleavened bread, implying sin. And it, of course, speaks to the church. And when was the church inaugurated? On the Feast of Pentecost. Each one of these feasts are fulfilled prophetically on their very day of observance. So, But the main idea is there is a high day. Turn to John 19.31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day. Not a Saturday. A high day in the sense of one of these, probably one of these seven feasts. It might have been the Feast of Unleavened Bread. What that does is it disconnects you from the week. You don't know what day of the week it was. People have assumed it's Friday because the next day was a Sabbath, but they assumed that that Sabbath meant Saturday. Uh-uh. It was the day before a Sabbath, a high day. Now, there were, during the week of the crucifixion, at least four Sabbaths of that week. There was Passover, unleavened bread, a Saturday somewhere, a Shabbat, and the Feast of First Fruits, which we call Sunday morning. The morning after the Sabbath, after Passover, is the way it's technically defined. So it isn't necessarily the 17th of Nisan. Now, the net of this, we could talk a lot about 
exactly what day he was crucified. And that's not my intention to get into that. It's very technical and you get some very, very complicated issues to get into. The main point is, it wasn't Friday. There are arguments for a Thursday, there's arguments for a Wednesday. To be the Wednesday is the clearest. But not conclusive, it's complicated. I, I don't want to derail this study getting in it. I just want you to be alerted to the fact that the scripture says Jesus spent three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Just as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. And we're not talking partial days, counting as whole days. And There's all these arguments you get into. Keep it simple. God does. But in any case, Colossians chapter 2. We talked last time about the blotting out of the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Remember the Tetelestai thing? We went into that. It was in verse 14, right? What did Jesus Christ do when he went into Sheol? Verse 15, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. But verse 16 is the one, the practical aspect of this that you might cling to. Put it in your little memory list if you are inclined to do that sort of thing. Let no man therefore judge you in food or in drink or in respect of a feast day or of a new moon or of a Sabbath day. That's instruction from a student of Gamaliel, a Pharisee of Pharisees of the tribe of Benjamin, none other than Saul of Tarsus, which you and I know as Paul. So if he can tell you that, I, that's great. Then the verse 17 points out that all of those are prophetic, which are a shadow of things to come. See, these Sabbaths and the, and the high days and the Yom Kippur and Passover, those are all prophetic in their significance. In Judaism, their historical origin and commemorative aspect is emphasized, understandably so. But the prophetic implication is very clear, and, and this is one of the several places where Paul points to that. Paul does a lot of that in Corinthians and in Colossians and elsewhere. We notice that God doesn't just have the fish cough Jonah up, but deposits him, using a little more polite term, on dry land. Okay? We might just throw a few verses into that discussion. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I think Jonah was a new creation. I think he died and was, in a sense, resurrected. Certainly, that view does not do violence to the type. In fact, quite the contrary. You might turn to John 12, 24. This is just an exercise to get you to buy tabs for your Bible. <laughs> and uh, the bookstore put me up to this. Very, very, I say unto you, except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it biteth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Many applications. Context here, of course, is the person of Jesus Christ, speaking of his death. Because it fit Jonah. He ran from Nineveh, but through that experience, he was given the call, arise, go to Nineveh a second time. And he goes. Did he bear much fruit? You bet. How about you and I? Have we died? Have we died to self? Are you really a new creation in Christ? That's a little thought for the evening. We can move on. Okay. Philippians 1.6. This all pops out of Jonah. This is the one I cling to. I think it's a fabulous verse. Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Has he started with you? Will he finish what he starts? You bet. What's your authority for that? Philippians 1.6. There's other places, but this is a dandy. I'm grateful for that. The Lord has started my life. I'm glad, he, you know, to know that he's not going to let go. When I stumble and fall and slip away and whatever, I know he's not finished yet. I also know he doesn't abandon what he starts. He follows through. So when you think of Jonah, deposit on dry land, God doesn't do anything halfway. He doesn't do anything halfway. Let's get into Jonah. I have enough of this sort of thrashing about. We actually made it to chapter 3, huh? The word of the Lord came unto Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city of three days' journey. Three days. That's a big place. Sixty miles? That's a big place. 
So don't visualize this in your mind eye as some quaint little berg of clay dwellings that sort of populates your Sunday school picture books. This was a big place. Capital of the Syrian Empire, uh, largest city in the ancient world, um, walls 100 feet high, wide enough to have three chariots abreast, 1,500 high towers, and uh, somewhere between a half a million to a million population, depending on how you interpret a few things. Bigger than Babylon was, even though Babylon succeeded in later years. Big operation. Okay. Nineveh was an exceedingly great city of three days' journey. I wonder if the Holy Spirit has a little pun there. Jonah blew three days getting there. A little detour, but all right. Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Yet forty days. You know, this 40 is worth your study. Get a concordance and dig up 40 and see how often it appears. The way we just determine what numbers mean, they seem to be used deliberately, skillfully by the Holy Spirit. Two is the number of witness and so on. And uh, five is the number of grace, it seems. Six is the number of man, one short of seven, thus incomplete in his, in his own behalf. Um, seven is not divine, it's complete. Generally, just well, it means complete or perfect. But don't forget, Satan has seven heads, so be careful. Eight, the number of new beginnings, an octave. It's seven plus one. It's a new beginning. Six is one short of seven or, or man or sin or that which is incomplete. Then number 12 seems to have the number of government or administration, 12 disciples and 12 tribes and so forth. Now, the number 40 seems to be the number of testing or probation, preparation, trial. Genesis 7, 17, they're associated with the flood. Exodus 24, 18, Moses on the mount. Uh, 1 Kings 19, 8, Elijah's flight to Horeb. And of course, none other than Matthew 40, is the, the temptation of the Lord himself. 40 days. It seems to be here, too, a number which implies probation. They got 40 days to get their act together. We're going to find out later in chapter 4, that's what upset Jonah. He wanted... Nineveh judged this horrible, sinful symbol of all that is ungodly. Remember the musical Kismet? It's only two things that ever a culture came out of L.A. Caesar salad and musical Kismet, right? Okay. Well, the musical Kismet. If you hear the song, not since Nineveh. Nineveh was used as sort of a benchmark of just how bad you could be, even in in popular uh, literary uh, um, connotations. So Jonah wanted it judged. Forty days it should be overthrown. You get the impression that Jonah just told him, hey, it's, it's going to happen, guys. You do not get the impression that Jonah preached a gospel of grace or repentance. In fact, in chapter 4, he goes into a huge pout because it worked. They repented. And Jonah's upset. His reputation as a prophet is destroyed. <laughs> Jonah's strange. Don't judge Jonah too harshly because you're going to find a mirror there of you and I, so be careful. So what happens then? He says, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Uh, be overthrown. Verse 5, the people of Nineveh believe God. Simple sentence. It's the biggest miracle in the book. You've got nine other miracles that pale into comparison and to have this gigantic, heathen, idol-worshipping city believe God and repent. Read on. They believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth, and the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For word came into the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne and laid his robe uh, from him and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes, which is a classic, ancient ritual for repentance, mourning. Very Judaistic, but also practiced in some of the other ancient cultures, apparently. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. King and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. That's bizarre, isn't it? The cattle, the animals too? Strange. But comprehensive. Comprehensive. The concept was to make a point. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. They covered the animals. With sackcloth. You girls who love horses, you must sort of wince at that, huh? Well, I guess you put blankets on them too, don't you? Well, it's a different kind of thing here. 
can't see my daughter doing that, you know. Blanket, maybe, not sackcloth. <laughs> and cry mightily unto God, yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. The Assyrians, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Assyria was known for their brutality. When they conquered a, tr uh, a city and they, they take the noble, impale them on a pole while al and skin them alive, just to make a point, they uh, didn't mess around. These guys were, they played rough. No wonder Jonah grabbed a ship to Tarshish. He's going to go into that city and preach? <laughs> it's not hard to visualize Jonah's action. I can't rationalize it. Obviously, it was dumb, but yet understandable in a sense. So what does he do? He goes down the streets wearing his play cards or holding a sign, 40 days and comes destruction. Huh? <laughs> now, what do these people do but repent? Boy, is Jonah's going to be upset about that. But anyway, we'll see in a minute. Notice now something interesting. Apparently, Jonah did not preach grace, did not preach repentance. He said, hey, you guys, you got 40 days and it's over. You guys got 40 days and it's all there is. Notice what they did. They put on sackcloth and ashes on themselves and on the people and went into a fast, no water, no food. Why? Verse 9, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? They did this on the thin thread of hope. The logic being that if we got 40 days, boy, that's 39 more than he might have given us. And maybe if we show him we're serious, we can avert his anger. Isn't that interesting? You and I hear the message of God's grace and his forgiveness so much, we take it for granted, shrug it off. I mean, you know, maybe tomorrow. You know what I mean? These people did not have that. They inferred it. They are, their instinct, if I can call it that, their, their, their uh, presumption, the presupposition about God was that he was a merciful God. They had no reason to believe that. And apparently not from Jonah. And verse 10, what a fabulous verse. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Well, now we can get into volumes of books. Can God repent? Tells you the kind of books that float around somebody in some libraries. But anyway, uh, let's see. Repentance. The word repentance in the Old Testament is the word nakam. The original root meant to sigh, to pant, to groan. The word came to mean to lament, to grieve, to pity. So the word repent, as it's used in the Hebrew in the Old Testament, doesn't mean that God changed his mind. God is immutable, cannot change. God knows the end from the beginning. Sometimes the easy way to deal with this is just to read it as if it's put that way for our understanding. That's the way it's often taught and it's reasonable. But the word really means is God repented in the sense that he grieves, pities, and thus lifts a sentence or delays a judgment or whatever. Do you follow me? It doesn't mean he changed his mind. God doesn't change his mind. God can't learn. He knows everything. Now, quiz question. Counts double credit. How many times does the word Nakam appear in the Old Testament? Forty. Isn't that interesting? Those kind of things fascinate me. They don't know what to do with that piece of information. A couple other things. Uh, it's interesting now. We'll learn some other things about jo Jonah here. I'm going to suggest to you that Jonah has another type. We've seen him, obviously, as a type of Christ, authenticated by Matthew 12 and so on. We've explored that to some extent. There is another sense in which Jonah is a type, a model, an allegory, uh, an analogy, if you will. And that's a type of Israel. You notice that Israel was originally called to the Gentiles to be a missionary organ of God to the Gentiles. When Abraham was first called, go back to the founding of Israel in the sense of the call of Abraham. Genesis 12. 
The Lord said to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and thy kindred and from thy father's house and the land that I will show thee and make thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curses thee and in thee shall all Israel be blessed. No. In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. The call of Abraham is far, far more important than simply the birth, if you will, of the nation Israel, in a sense. That idea is being challenged by the major nations today. Israel's right to the land goes back to the land grant that God gave Abraham, not in that verse elsewhere. And it's interesting how the world at large will challenge that. So as you read, when you read the conflicts in Palestine and all the problems, and they're serious ones, uh, between all the various constituencies, things recognize that what's really at the root of that is their right to the land. Where does it come from? From the Torah, from the book of Genesis. Marish it. And that uh, will eventually cause the entire world to go to war. The prophets tell us. It's interesting how we watch it just position itself that way today. But anyway, moving on. We go to Isaiah 43, Exodus 19, other places. Israel's mission was to the Gentiles. Did they succeed? Answer, no. It was prophesied that they would not succeed the first time. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 28. Israel failed at her mission. She did not become an adequate or effective witness to the Gentiles, even to the climax of rejecting her Mashiach when he appeared. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. Deuteronomy 28, verse 64 and following. The Lord shall scatter thee among all people, and from one end of earth even to the other, and there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou or thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease. Neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest, but the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart and failing of eyes and a sorrow of mind. The tragedy of the wandering Jew the Jew without a homeland. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and thou shalt have no assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were evening. And evening thou shalt say, Would God it were morning. For the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes uh, thou shalt see, and the Lord shall bring thee, and so on. And on it goes. You might also pick up chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, just a few verses. It has come to pass that when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the cursing which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations to which the Lord God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul, then the Lord God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations where the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. All the nations. This was not not fulfilled in Babylon. Babylon was one nation who went into captivity for 70 years and, and returned. That was their first regathering, but it was from one nation, Babylon. This regathering is from all nations, right? If you recall Daniel 9, the 70 week prophecy, he says, In the end, there shall be with a diaspora, an outpouring. And uh, that was right after what? The crucifixion of Christ when the Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. Daniel chapter 9, 25, 26, and 27. We'll take the time now. Let's just turn to Isaiah 11. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11, It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Milan and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the coastlands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Praise God. Jonah was called the first time. Did he do it properly? No, he blew it. In chapter 1 of Jonah, verse 2, it says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. Did he? No, he blew it. Chapter 3, verse 2, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it. Did he do it? Yes. Was it successful? Yes. Israel was called once. Was it successful? No, it rejected the Messiah when sent. The second time is underway. We're seeing the beginning of it. Let's turn to Ezekiel 36. 
Verse 24 is the one that's usually quoted here. Let's just pick it up and then I'm going to backtrack a little bit. For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Often quoted. Why? Because Israel is gathered together in her own land. But it's important for you and I to get the perspective as to why is God doing this? Why is God regathering Israel into the land? Let's back up to verse 21 and pick those next those three verses, 21, 22, and 23. God says, but I had pity for your sakes. No, for I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel hath profaned among the nations to which they went. If the world, the heathen world today, depended on the testimony of Israel for the nature of God, God's in trouble. Huh? Therefore say unto the house of Israel, verse 22, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the nations to which I went. And I will sanctify my great name, which is profaned among the nations, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. In other words... The heathen know that God promised to take care of Israel. So he's doing it for his name's sake, not because they deserve it. Interesting insight, isn't it? So why do we watch Israel for God's sake? Does that mean we agree with their politics? Heavens no. Does that mean they can do no wrong? Heavens no. But is God's hand upon Israel? You bet. You bet. Why? Because he's faithful. He said he would. And he's doing it to keep his word, not because they merit it. Huh? Interesting situation. And the whole theme in Ezekiel here is that they shall know that I am the Lord. Who's they? Israel? No. The whole world. And in chapters 36, we're going to get here into the dry bones where he regathers the land, the people into the land, puts flesh on them, they're gathered. But in unbelief, there is an event that will shock them into orthodoxy, into realizing that God is, again, has his hand on them. That event is described in Ezekiel 38 and 39. An invasion in which five, six of the forces that are invading get wiped out. Very, very important passage. It sets the stage. It's the event that lets... The whole world will be shocked, but Israel most of all. Because they'll realize then. There won't be any rationalization like the Six-Day War. Won't be any rationalization like the Yom Kippur War. Where they, you know, it's us. Aren't we great? They are good. But that doesn't explain what happened. Very interesting is we're going to see three major wars. Six-Day War, what are the three major events? The creation. What's the symbol of the creation? The six days. Right? What's the next major event? The atonement. Yom Kippur. What's the third event? Redemption. Interesting, isn't it? How God is setting the stage. Just stand back and watch. Praise his holy name. Now, let's see. We pick up one more. Let's pop over to Ze Zechariah 8. I realize you'll all remember Zechariah. This is all by way of review, of course. This is the second call now. We're, we're looking ahead in the future, and let's pick it up at verse 20. Je Zechariah 8, verse 20. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, it, it shall yet come to pass that there shall come peoples and inhabitants of many cities, and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts. Where? In Jerusalem. You've got to be kidding. Is this some kind of provincial nationalism of the old the Hebrew prophets in the Old Testament? No. This isn't God's word, and there is a destiny for Jerusalem. And I pray before the Lord. Let's say the Lord of hosts in those days shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold of uh, all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Does that describe today's attitude? I don't think so. That's yet future. Watch for it. Lots of parallels between Jonah and Israel. Chosen of God, commissioned by God, disobedient to the will of God, found, among, found themselves among the Gentiles. Through them, heathen came to know God. They were miraculously preserved. And there's prayers and promises and so forth. All this should give you and I great hope because we're backsliders at various times, various ways, to varying degrees. Jonah was a backslider. Went to Tarshish instead of Nineveh. He was resurrected. 
and he was fruitful. So by the grace of God, you and I can be made fruitful, even if we at the moment or from time to time are on a ship on its way to Tarshish. Okay, back to Jonah. The question of the evening is, why didn't it end with chapter 3? Wouldn't it be a neat little book? You know, here's the story of Jonah, and he did the wrong thing, and God dealt with him, and he went to Nineveh and bore fruit. And the most incredible miracle is chapter 3, the repentance of Nineveh. Why didn't God end it there? A nice little three-chapter book. But there's chapter 4. And maybe the reason that chapter 4 is here is that God's objective for you had not been met yet. Whatever is in chapter 4 apparently is required to be complete. Holy Spirit wasn't done yet. Chapter 4 is a bizarre little chapter about this gourd, a worm, and an east wind. Right up till now, you can sort of relate to this. It's got drama, it's got adventure, and excitement, and it's got missions, and it's got repentance. I mean, you have any, any yardstick you want to use, great book for three chapters. And we get chapter four. Well, let's take a look at what happens. Strange thing. You, now, here's Jonah, called of God, goes to Nineveh, the largest city of the, of the old world, and he gets repented. Wouldn't you think, if you were an I, we'd have our thumb under our suspenders and saying, boy, did we have a crusade in Nineveh, let me tell you. you know, <laughs> talk about an altar call. Yeah. <laughs> Look at verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Let's be awfully careful. Uh, we can, I, I usually look at Jonah and laugh, and uh, he bewilders me. And yet I know by the Holy Spirit that there, but for the grace of God, go you and I. Whatever's bothering Jonah is some manifestation of something that's wrong with you and I, not just him. So let's tread on this very cautiously. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the, of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Weird attitude. Weird attitude. I wonder if that's you and I. You know, it's all right for our family to be saved. But some detestable sinner down the street, should they be saved too? <laughs> well, well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's somebody in the air that the message of Jonah is for. Yeah. <laughs> but notice God then answers Jonah in verse 4. He says, the Lord says, uh, Doest thou well to be angry? You notice he doesn't rebut him. doesn't scold him. Well, there, there's probably 17 different responses, all of which would be justified. But God is patient and kind and gracious. And he's no less to Jonah. He said, hey, Jonah, do you do well to get upset? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made a booth for himself or a lean-to or a shanty, okay, a booth for himself, and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. The implication is, we're not sure of this, the scholars are divided in exactly what's going on here, but basically it looks like the 40 days aren't over yet. You see? But he's going to see what's going to happen. Because they, they've repented, but God says he's going to be judged in 40 days. He's going to sit there and let's see what happens here. Right? <laughs> see if they get theirs, you know. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come over Jonah that he might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. Now the word gourd and all this, getting this, the scholars seem to believe that this is the Palma Christi, which is a castor bean plant. The Rissimum communis is the, my butchered Latin of it. 
huge leaves, grows to eight or ten feet tall, grows very rapidly. It's indigenous to India, Middle East, Africa, very rapidly growing. Uh, palm, large leafed, ten foot high thing, grows sometimes a couple of feet a day. Grows very rapidly. It's also though very, very vulnerable to worms and insects, and it can die just as quickly. I've not been able to figure out why it's called Palma Christi. For some reason, that seems to be the common name. So first of all, Jonah plays hermit. Goes out on this hill, builds himself a lean-to to watch over the city, see what's going to happen. He's in a pout. Huh? Not only is the shade there, but this gourd grows up to give him really nice shade from the heat. And he likes that. He's grateful. He thinks that's a neat deal. But God prepared a worm. He can build a great fish. He can also prepare a worm. <laughs> the Hebrew here implies it could be plural. It might be a collective noun, not worms singular, but, you know, worms, if you will. But in any case, uh, when the morning rose the next day, it smote the gourd and it withered. And it came to pass that when the sun did rise, that God prepared a vehement east wind. Three things going on here. The gourd grew up quickly. Worm destroyed it. East wind blows. Hot, tough. The sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? You notice God never answered his question earlier in verse 4. Doest thou well to be angry? What was Jonah angry about? The salvation of Nineveh. So he's up on the hill, Builds a lean-to, gourd comes, shades him. God destroys the gourd, the wind comes. Now he's angry. Now God says, doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, thou hast had pity on the gourd, for which thou hast not labored, neither madest it to grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than six score thousand persons which, that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? And the book ends. Interesting rebuttal. The gourd and the worm was to give Jonah a point. He was upset about the gourd. Had he done contributed anything? No. Did he own it? No. What's God's attitude about Nineveh? He labored over it. He owned it. Now, by the way, so you don't get confused, six score thousand persons. Six score is 120,000. Score is 20. Six times 20 is 120,000 persons. These are children. These are children. In other words, yes, they're sinners in the city, but these are children. There's 120,000. God's saying, hey, a, setting aside the issue of, of the sin and all that. What about the 120,000, Jonah? Should I not spare them? Remember what happened in Genesis um, 18. The angels that went to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah could not touch the city as long as Lot was there. They didn't just get Lot out as a favor to Abraham because he's his nephew. They, when the angels pleaded with Lot to get out of there, he says, we cannot do our job until you're out of here. Remember earlier, and that's really important. We got, we're, we're not running tight for time. Let's go turn, turn to Genesis 18. Important, important issue for lots of reasons. It's a famous event in the life of Abraham by the Oaks of Mamre, where these three strangers come up there. And uh, Abraham asks Sarah to prepare three measures of meal, which inaugurates that gesture in both the Arab as well as the Jewish world as the meal offering, the hospitality, three measures of meal. And that's in verse 6. It turns out that of these three gentlemen that are passing by and taking of Abraham's hospitality, two of them are angels. They've got an agenda. They've got to go over to Sodom and Gomorrah. They've got an errand to run. The third appears to be an Old Testament appearance of none other than Jesus Christ. And of course, they announced to Sarah that she's going to have a child, and she laughs. And thinks that's kind of, shall I have pleasure in my old age? You know, an amusing part there. But then... Um, in verse 22, the men turned their faces from there, and they went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? 
back up here, verse 16, the men rose up from there and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abram that which I do, seeing that Abram should surely become a great and mighty nation? All nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, for I know him that he will command his children, and so forth. And the Lord said, verse 20, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it, which has come to me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood before the Lord. Now Abraham goes into an interesting negotiation. If I was better at dialect stories, you could almost put a, you know, a New York accent on this whole thing. Abraham says, Wilt thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are in it? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of the, all the earth do right? This is Abraham reasoning with the creator of the universe. <laughs> The Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all their place for their sakes. Wow! What a principle. God's saying, that, Hey, if there's fifty righteous there, I'll spare the place. You and I would sit back in, in awe and reflect on that. But Abraham is what we call chutzpah. <laughs> Abraham answered and said, verse 27, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, who am I, who am but dust and ashes. Suppose there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Will thou destroy the, all the city for lack of five? Then he said, If I find forty and five, I will not destroy it. So God says, Okay. Not fifty. If I find forty-five. Okay. And Abraham spoke again to him again. He says, would you believe 30? No, I see. Would you? He says, should there should be 40 found there? And he said, I will do it not for 40's sake. He said to him, oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose there should 30 be found there. He said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, behold, now I have taken by me to speak unto the Lord. Suppose there shall be 20 found there. And he said, I shall not destroy it for 20's sake. You know, he's getting a little more aggressive. It was five off, you know, 10% the first time. And now he's, getting, he's just lopping off 10 times. <laughs> Verse 32. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. I will speak yet but this once. Suppose 10 shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had ceased talking with Abraham. And Abraham returned into his place. What we discover in chapter 19, if there is one there... He spares the place, or gets that one out of there. Now, it's interesting that Jesus Christ points to the example of Lot when speaking of his second coming. Because what happens here? The two, the two angels go to, to um, Sodom to visit Lot, and the, the homosexuals of the city, they had their gay community too, uh, wanted to take these guys. They got refuge in the house, but they're beating on the door. He said, hey, hey, don't worry, guys. i got a couple of daughters that are virgins. Take them instead. Don't bother my, my visitors. You've got to be kidding. That's sick. The angels blind these guys so they can't find their way around, so that takes care of that problem. But then they plead with Lot to get out of there. Notice verse 22. These are the two angels that are about to wipe out this place. Haste thee, escape there, for I cannot do anything till thou become there. In other words, get out of here. We can't. It's not a question of, hey guys, get out of here because you'll get you'll you'll miss this mess. No, no, you got to get out of here because we can't do our job until you do. We're under orders. And the implication, very strong implication, this argues very very strongly for the church to be taken out before the great tribulation. Good question. Were there not children in Sodom and Gomorrah? Good question. Sodom and Gomorrah is wiped out, all of them, and lots out of there. Now, when we get, of course, getting back to Jonah, that's obviously the argument he's making, God is making with Jonah. Hey, Jonah, if you're so upset about this gourd, which you didn't labor for or anything, why aren't you upset about the 120,000 children in the city? That's the analogy he's making. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't extend that to assume that any place there's children is not going to be judgment. No. One other small point uh, in 2 Kings 4.39, there's a poisonous gourd called the bitter apple. 
it's got nothing to do with this, I don't think, but there's usually references, cross-references to the gourd, the different gourds we believe. It's interesting that the gourd is also a symbol of salvation, and it's used in the temple as a decorative symbol, meaning salvation. You know, 1 Kings 7.24 is an example of some other things. Now, that's the book of Jonah. Interesting little book. In some respects for you and I, chapter 4 is perhaps the most practical. Strange little chapter, it's added on here, but it requires us to, to think through where we're at. And I would suggest to you that the key idea in Jonah is missions. Missions. The gourd can be symbolic of comforts of home. Jonah was comfortable under the gourd and upset when it left. And I wonder how you and I are at. You know, before we get too tough on Jonah, where are we at? Do we have a burden for lost souls? Do we really understand that there is a Sheol and ultimately, a, you know, a, a Gehenna for the lost? Do we really care? Jonah didn't, and the Lord interfered. Jonah led a fruitful life. But even there, you see his attitude in chapter 4. And before we get too critical, let's be careful that it isn't our attitude too. And uh, get out of your gourd for God. How's that, huh? Okay. It's all downhill from here. We better stand for a closing word of prayer.